I have to thank you for accepting the interview for Alga TV. The main questions at this moment, how you, your view as a president of Armenia for this war? Well, I'm the president of the Republic of Armenia, and as, as you know, this is a parliamentary republic. And being a president of a par parliamentary republic, and specifically in the case of Armenia and Armenians, that are a, uh, well, the country is a small country, Armenia itself, but we are a worldwide nation. And there are millions of Armenians living from the United States, uh, Latin America, Canada, Europe, anywhere in Europe, Russia, Far East, and indeed in the Middle East. And of course, historically, this, this huge Armenian community, worldwide community, and the population of Armenians worldwide is several times bigger than the population of Republic of Armenia. Being a president means that you are sort of responsible for what is happening, not only in Republic of Armenia, but also in Armenian world, worldwide. Responsible that anything happening to Armenians here and there is, uh, is something that must be a part of your, your attention. But uh, Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh or Republic of, of Artsakh is different because this was a part of historic Armenia, not for hundreds of years, but thousands of years. And, it's, and if you travel to Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, it's a beautiful country if you, if you have seen that. And it's historic evidence is that Armenians were there for, for thousands of years is there. So Armenians are natives of that world. Armenians are the owners of, of that land and they have been uh, there forever. So whatever is happening in Nagorno-Karabakh or in Artsakh, Republic of Artsakh, is something that is important for all Armenia world for several reasons. And of course, it's important for the President of Republic of Armenia as well. The Azerbaijani government, they said that Artsakh is um, being taken by the Armenian and is their own land. How that's true? Well, okay, let's... They are saying that they are there and they have started the war on the 27th of September, claiming that they are there to liberate uh, Artsakh, to liberate. The question is to liberate from whom? I mean, I mean it's uh, something going to, to an, uh, any country and saying we want to liberate you from yourselves. <laughs> I mean, how you can liberate that country from those people who have been living there for thousands of years? The only reason, or, or a, a, a sort of a, a not reason, excuse they are trying to, to find here is that for 70 years, Comrade Stalin gave it to them uh, to be a part of uh, Soviet Azerbaijan. But even under Soviet Azerbaijan, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was an autonomous region, had its own government, and it had absolute majority of Armenians living there. So that excuse of invasion, liberation of Nagorno-Karabakh or Republic of Artsakh, doesn't stand any criticism. It's, it's absolute nonsense. The real, reality is, when you are speaking of coming to Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh, liberating them, basically you are uh, saying that we are coming to clean up Armenians from that land. And that in the uh, modern vocabulary means ethnic cleansing, basically pushing all Armenians out and, and having the land. So basically for them, this war is about piece of land. For Armenians in Artsakh, this is a fight for their life, for their dignity, for their religion, for their history of thousands of years. It's a fight for their families, for their children, for the human right of living where you have been living for thousands of years. It's about a fight for them home. That is why these people will not be defeated because they are fighting for life. The other side is fighting for, for death, because they're, they're fighting for killing Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and <laughs> liberating from those who have been for thousands of years inhabitants and the natives of that land. If I ask you who's winning this war so, till now, so far? Well, uh, who is winning, who, who, who's uh, losing eventually will be decided when the ceasefire will be established or the war will come to, to a conclusion. Uh, and the definition of winning a war 
in this case, for both sides, is different. Because Armenians were not interested at all in getting into war with Azerbaijan, because Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh or our Republic of Artsakh didn't have any intention of starting a war and invading Azerbaijan, because they have their homeland, what they were focusing on building up their, their, their country. So they didn't have any intention of a war. And for them, winning a war means defending their homeland. Winning a war for Azeri side is killing all Armenians or pushing them out. Something that happened to Armenians 105 years ago, at the end of the Ottoman Empire in Turkey, when Armenians who were living in Western Armenia or Eastern Anatolia for again thousands of years, were pushed by, by the Turkish forces. One and a half million people were killed. Others run away toward, towards Syria, Middle East, towards uh, the deserts of Derzor. And eventually they ended up in, in, in Americas, in Europe, in Russia, worldwide. This is how the Armenian diaspora was created. So this is another uh, attempt of an Armenian genocide in Artsakh, in Nagorno-Karabakh. And surprise, surprise, who is present there? Who is taking part in this process? Turkey. Turkey is not only supporting Azerbaijan, Turkey is present, is actively involved in this war. So again, the answer to your question, winning a war for Armenians will be defending their homeland. Winning for Azerbaijan would mean just ethnic cleansing of Armenians. Let's see. So. As a journalist, I get confused by the Turkey's uh, government speech. They said they are not involved in the war, but the second day or another half an hour, they said they are supporting Azerbaijan. So, can you explain it to me more clearly? Well, uh, this, uh, Turkish di diplomacy is famous, and uh, I would like to remind here the famous words of Abraham Lincoln. He was saying, you can fool the whole world for some short period of time, or you can fool a, a small group of people for a long period of time, but you cannot fool the whole world all the time. I think this is an attempt of fooling people what is happening. Indeed, uh, Turkey is fully involved in what is happening there. It's through their generals that are basically coordinating and running the world through their officers who are participating, through their soldiers and advisors, through their military equipment and the drones that are crossing not only the borders of, of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, that have, some of them have crossed the borders of Armenia as well, through the military equipment that are provided to Azerbaijan, through the F-16 fighters that are used there, Turkish, well, no, Azerbaijan doesn't have F-16 fighters. And the worst thing is that they brought together and they paid uh, Islamist uh, terrorists to come to, into this war. And this is not just my words, this is not journalistic word. This is a facts that are not only processed, but announced by several states and their, their intelligence organizations or departments. This is a fact. So Turkey is involved. And because of this involvement, it makes this, this war, today's war, much more complex than any clash that we had in Nagorno-Karabakh before. Because before what we had was the people of Nagorno-Karabakh, or Republic of Artsakh and Azerbaijan, basically, after the referendum in 91, when these people who had the absolute majority of the population of nagorno karabakh voted for independence, and the answer to that, instead of coming and having discussions and discussing what to do next, the Azeri side decided to start a war and kill people. That's, uh, that's where we are. The role of Turkey is very important. As you said, whatever they do is very contradictory. On one side, sometimes they say we are not involved. On the other side, something is happening in, during this war. They are, they are the first to react even quicker than Azerbaijani side. So I leave it to your audience to, 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 to judge and to decide. Is that like what we see now in the uh, uh, Republic of Artsakh or uh, Nagorno-Karabakh? It's new. Uh, a crime again by Turkish against the Armen using this time Azerbaijan? Yeah, yeah. I think you can, you can, I think, describe this, whatever is happening. You can the, the, uh, describe the whole situation differently. 
It uh, depends what is your perspective and how do you look, look at it. If you look uh, as with a, with, with a, from the perspective of a sort of a very uh, unbiased political analyst, from the point of view of geopolitics, what you see here is Turkey is clearly in a process of becoming more important and forcing their presence in Caucasus. And basically trying to destroy the status quo that was there, not only in, between Nagorno-Karabakh or Artsakh and Azerbaijan, but generally in Caucasus. Trying to be more important and breaking all possible uh, status quo and enforcing their presence there, enforcing their presence in Azerbaijan. They are very strong now in, in small autonomous republic of uh, Nakhichevan, which is between Armenia and Turkey and belongs to Azerbaijan. I think Turkey has more influence now in Nakhichevan than the Azeri government. Now they are in Azerbaijan, very heavily involved in running the military. They have brought uh, terrorists in huge numbers. They are pretending that they are, they are there to defend or protect the international energy logistics, which is absolute nonsense. Because for 20 years that log logistics, that pipelines are there, Armenians never sh shot even a bullet in that direction. Allowing Azerbaijan to make billions of dollars and using that billions to buy arms and now using that arms to kill Armenians. So if Armenians had to shoot these pipelines, they would probably had to shoot it 20 years ago, not now. But it, uh, Turkey pretends that they are there to, pretend, to protect it, but in reality they are there. To have, more control, to have more control over the pipeline. That's making Europe a sort of a hostage. Because the pipeline is not only Azeri oil and gas, it's also the oil and gas from Central Asia or Caspian region going by that pipeline to Europe, for example. So if Turkey will sit there, obviously they will have control. And if they are, have a control, they will dictate when to open the pipeline, when to close it. So basically a lot of European countries will be depending not on their agreement, commercial agreement, on with Azerbaijan or Azerbaijani oil company or international oil corporations, but also on, on the will of Turkey and Turkish government and Turkish president. The same will happen to Central Asia and the republics or the countries of, of, of uh, Caspian, because they'll be defend, depending on Turkish will, either to allow this oil or gas to go or to stop it. So Turkey is trying to be dominant there. This is one perspective that you can look at it. The other perspective is coming in using Azerbaijani hands. They are trying to, to teach a lesson to Armenians. I think that their real human way of behaving after 105 years of genocide when the Mayo, a lot of states in the world have recognized the Armenian genocide. I'm not speaking about academics, historians and so on. States, starting with the same the same three members of the Minsk group. I mean, you take Russia has recognized the genocide. Many countries of Europe, including France, has recognized the, the genocide. And recently, last uh, year, the American Senate has voted unanimously recognizing the Armenian genocide. So instead of recognizing, sitting down with Armenians, talking about future, how these two nations can live together, they want to continue and maybe to show Armenians that they can repeat it again and they want to teach a lesson. Show to Azerbaijan, if you cannot solve the problem yourselves, we will solve it, solve it with you. But uh, their main interest will be, as they are doing in other places, their main uh, target will be pretty simple. Have their strong presence in Caucasus, make Caucasus unstable, like they are, their presence in Syria makes Syria un unstable. Well, they are speaking about territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, but what about territorial integrity of Iraq? Turkish forces are inside Iraq. What about territorial integrity of Syria? What are Turkish forces doing? What is Turkey doing in Libya? What do they have to do in Libya? They were in Egypt. What they were doing in Egypt? Now they are, they are creating a problem in Mediterranean with Cyprus, even Israel, and with Greece and so on. They have territorial claims or ethnic helping ethnic brothers in, in Bulgaria and so on. So this country is creating instabilities all around itself. And maybe thinking that 
through instabilities, they will become more important and Turkey will basically will get something that they deserve as a superpower. In reality, they have become a bully of the whole region. Uh, Mr. President, you mentioned the, the Turkish army, they moving the radical group and the, the jihadists to the border with Azerbaijan and the uh, Republic of Artsakh. How Turkish they could do that uh, under the, the, uh, the control and the watching of the international community? What does the international community, was the international community checking every and each truck that was traveling from Turkey by a third country to Azerbaijan? Was the international community checking every and each airplane that was flying from Turkey through third, uh, third countries to Azerbaijan? No. I mean, the international community is not there. They are not the checkers of the, on the borders. Well, I hope they will become checkers on the borders now because when there is a war, I think the human dignity shows that during a war, even if you have a contract of supplying anything that is related to the conflict, that is related to, to killing people or destroying civilians, I think you have to restrain yourself and you have to use uh, the excuse that this is, uh, this is unexpected situation and during the unexpected situation any contract should be stopped until the war is over. But Turkey has moved huge number of, of uh, jihadists and, and terrorists there and these uh, several thousands of them, are they going to leave Azerbaijan or they are going to become another headache for Azerbaijan and for the region? What do you think? Russia will be happy having them on their southern borders? What do you think? Iran will be happy having them on their northern borders? And what do you think? Central Asian republics will be happy if these jihadists will be traveling from Azerbaijan into one of their, their countries? No. I mean, this is where it comes, that international community has to put tremendous pressure on Turkey, so in, uh, in order to force uh, Turkey with, uh, to withdraw from this conflict. So if it's possible for international community to stop Turkey, to make unstable uh, places, different, well, you mentioned like Libya, Syria, and now is uh, the border between Azerbaijan and uh, Republic of Artsakh, and uh, in, uh, in uh, many places like um, uh, Mediterranean region as well. So do you think the international community could do something to stop uh, Turkish no keep going. Well, I hope so. Otherwise, I think uh, I think this snowball will 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 grow and grow and grow and become a disaster for everybody. I think it should be stopped. And in my my first interest, that it should be stopped here in Caucasus, because this is a crossroad of many things, starting from Silk Road, uh, energy uh, roads, uh, civilizations, everything. It's a place where different religions come together and live together for hundreds of years. So it's a very crucial place and it should be stopped. And of course, while speaking about the international community, I, I, I think from United States and North, North America, Latin America, European Union, institutions really, international organizations starting from United Nations up to European Union, NATO, other organizations, up to China, anybody has to. But of course, our, 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 in our view, I think the most important uh, states that have sort of an obligation to, to do the, this are the, those three countries that are uh, the co-chairs of the Minsk Group. The Minsk Group of uh, OSCE was created in order to be a, a platform for negotiations between the parties, to come to final negotiated conclusion and status of Nagorno-Karabakh. I mean, international community has done a lot of work creating this platform, having the co-chairs, which are United States, France, and Russia. So how, how, how better you can get in this? And for more than 20 years, we were having the negotiations. And to be honest, there was a lot of progress this, during these negotiations because the parties were negotiating every detail. And eventually, they had on, on their negotiating the table a lot of things agreed. What was not agreed, are, there were several principal issues. But you continue negotiating. You don't stop negotiating because you are unhappy. 
If you represent a nation, I represent a nation, or you represent an important company I represent, I cannot say I'm not happy with you and I stop negotiations because the aim is, the aim is to, to get a negotiated peace or settlement. And what is, if you don't negotiate, what is the alternative? Alternative is war and death. So what is your choice between negotiating peace or you want to, uh, to, to choose the, the not negotiated war that is, is taking uh, lives of uh, hundreds and hundreds of people from both sides, both our Armenian side of Artsakh and also Azerbaijan. So that is why I think the key factor is going to be if international community, and first of all, of course, it's, it should be Russia. Why? Well, the United States is very important. The voice of U.S. president is very important. The European Union is very important here, and I, I would like to take this opportunity also to thank President Macron for his efforts. I would like to thank all three presidents for their efforts, what they are doing. And the third is Russia, but Russia has special uh, position. It's not only a, a world superpower, but it's, it is important that Russia is a country that has good relations both with Azerbaijan and with Armenia. And because Armenia is linked or connected to, to Nagorno-Karabakh, and it will, it will support Nagorno-Karabakh, even if the state stops, the people of Armenia will, will continue doing that. I think the role of Russia is very important. And it was, it was not only important, but also very vital and, and strong that, that uh, interference of Russia, keeping uh, calm in the region. Several clashes that we had during the last 20 years, including the one on, uh, in 2016 and the one that happened this July, Russian military and the foreign office have been instrumental in stopping it and containing it in a small scale. Now Russia is trying as well, but today what is different? It's the scale of the confrontation and Turkey. That makes the whole situation much more complex. That's why I'm saying there is a clear path that I can see and many can see to ceasefire and peace re and restart of negotiations. And that path is through Minsk process. But in order to restart Minsk process, in order to have ceasefire, then building up some trust, then bringing negotiators back to Minsk process, you have to exclude this, this phenomena, which is Turkey. Yes, Turkey is not a a member of the Minsk group, a co-chairs of the Minsk group. It's trying to make its presence important. It's trying to force that I want to have my say, while that say is destructive. Three countries, all of them have very constructive role there. And they have one aim, which is to build up trust, to finish these negotiations, and come to negotiated peace. Well, Turkey doesn't have that aim. So it not can be neither a mediator nor a peace process for part. If the Turkish army is not involved anymore in Azerbaijan, if it's possible, the Republic of Armenia and Azerbaijan could make a deal to, for, for example, to stop the war. Well, the, the, the answer to your question is, is the history of the la last 26 years or 30 years. The first war that was early 90s until 94, and then a uh, ceasefire was negotiated through international community. And that ceasefire stayed tw for 26 years. There was no Turkey. Well, Turkey was, if they are supporting Azerbaijan in their education, science, uh, agriculture, good luck. I'm happy for them. But putting themselves as a side of a conflict, becoming a military supporter, and trying to basically change the balance, military balance, it's a completely different story. So our history of 26 years have shown that if the Armenian side, which is the Republic of Artsakh, and of course Armenia, and Azerbaijan were left together, there are many ways of bringing them to the table of negotiation. Because they were negotiating more than 20 years. Armenia was negotiating on behalf of the Republic of Nagorno-Karabakh with Azerbaijan. This is the Minsk co-chairs platform. And this, as I said, it, it was making progress. But now the Turkish involvement puts a question mark. Will it be possible? 
with the presence of Turkey, I mean, you and I are negotiating. There is a third party saying, interfering every each time we are trying to agree something. How, how can it work? And especially that side is not a side of the conflict or is not a side which is interested in, in, the, in what is happening. What is claiming, he is your relative. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is an example. It's your relative or we are far relatives to each other. We are ethnic brothers. Well, ethnic brothers. Turkish ethnic brothers start from Anatolia. They go to the northeast up to China and Mongolia. So where are they? Are they do they have the right of interfering every conflict what is happening in that whole area? I'm not speaking going to Arab world, finding another ethnic brother. They can find ethnic brothers in Europe now. Are they allowed to interfere there? And what is their interest? Their interest is not peace. Their interest is not to get a final solution. Their, uh, their interest is to make another, another region which is unstable and gain from this, gain from this in, instability. If there is like a deal for ceasefire between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan or between the uh, Republic of Artsakh and Azerbaijan, there is like loads uh, radical group and the militia who's in the border. So is any guarantee they're going to leave the border or is there going to be like a deal? Then they're going to be those radical group continues there. Well, first of all, I think your question is more to, to the president of Azerbaijan as well, because they're going to stay in his country. And I think any country that has uh, Islamist extremists and uh, jihadists there, we know what is going to happen to that country. Uh, second is to the, uh, to the regional powers that have to basically request that these people leave, uh, the, leave the area. And third is to international community to request again to the party that has brought them in, and this party is Turkey, to take them, to take them back. Because they are a source of great uh, instability. If there is like a deal for ceasefire between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, or between the uh, Republic of Artsakh and Azerbaijan, there is like loads uh, radical group and the militia who's in the border. So is any guarantee they're going to leave the border, or is there going to be like a deal, then they're going to be those radical group continues there? Well, first of all, I think who these jihadists are, numbers and so on, I don't even have to give it to you because international organizations and, uh, and the security services of several states have also already announced that. And I can refer you, the latest one was by, by the head of the Russian Foreign Intelligence who that confirmed that they are indeed there and in big numbers. So it's not my job to, to go into how many of them. Even, and, and it's clear in, it's not about five, 10 or 50 or even 100, it's big numbers. And we can see and we can see if, uh, on videos, visually, through the killed, captured, and so on and so forth, that they are there. And uh, their presence there is completely unacceptable. Mr. President, you recalled the, your ambassador in uh, Israel. Can you tell us why? Well, I can tell you, I can tell you that here in Armenia, in, in, in uh, Armenian world, and also friends of Armenia are not happy the way the Israeli government is, is, is running its relations with others. Openly claiming that the last, let's say, 20, 25 years, they had very good relations with Azerbaijan and taking that as a ground to, to supply Azerbaijan with military equipment. They're openly doing that. And well, I just called the president of Israel a couple of days ago and we had a long discussion about this. We know each other quite well. I, and I was in, in, in Israel on the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of Holocaust. Uh, I called him and uh, the point that, that I was making uh, was, uh, was clear. Mr. President, could you please put pressure on your government and speak to your government? Because when uh, your government uh, is telling that they have signed uh, these agreements with Azer uh, Azerbaijan years ago and this is agreements to supply Azerbaijan with defensive weapons, it doesn't uh, look true. First of all, Azerbaijan is using Israeli uh, weapons, not as a defensive, but as an offensive. 
And these are the, the drones, these are rockets, these are electronics, everything. All is used as an offensive. So it's not your contract telling that it's a defensive one is not right. Because it's a, all, of, all of these weapons are used as an offensive. Number two, it's not only offensive, it's offensive against civilians, which is completely unacceptable. And number three, it's not only it's offensive used against civilians, your government continues supplying during the war. And I think all international or human or humanitarian values are saying that if there is a war, that war is specific uh, situation when you have to stop supplying weapons until the war is over, then you maybe can continue doing that. It is, uh, it is something like acts of God, the war has started, and the more morality dictates you to stop during the war, not so supplying this or the other side. So I made these three points clear to a president. He promised me that he'll go back to his government. And the next day I sent him also a letter, or official letter from me to him, uh, with the same, more or less the same points made. So I'm waiting to hear from Israeli government. And specifically, it's, uh, it's difficult uh, to, to look well at the situation when you are speaking to a, a government that represents a nation that had the Holocaust. And what is happening now in, uh, in and around the Republic of Artsakh and, and uh, or Nagorno-Karabakh is not an attempt of a genocide. So I made it clear to, to my counterpart, to the President of Israel. Um, I was uh, I to witness in, in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh or Republic of Artsakh when it's been uh, bombing uh, the civilian by the Azerbaijan army. Are you going to do something to take the, anyone who is responsible for this to international court or to international community? Or what are you going to yeah. do about it? Well, first of all, there is a huge humanitarian crisis there because we are speaking of thousands and tens of thousands of women, children, families that have lost their houses and, uh, and that the, they as refugees are now are in Armenia. Well, they are not refugees in Armenia because they are in their bigger homeland. And, and the amazing thing is, even before the government started acting, individuals, volunteers started taking care of them. So this is the, the, another sign of there is no way that Azerbaijan or Azerbaijan or Turkey will win this war because this war for Armenians is about existence. This war of, uh, in a, in, uh, and for, for their homeland is a war for, for life. So people, you don't, they, they, you don't even have to organize them through government agencies because people are self-organized. Like self-organized are the volunteers that leave their families here and they voluntarily go and to, to fight uh, uh, near, together with their brothers in, in Nagorno-Karabakh. So you don't have the government even to start acting when the individuals or NGOs starting taking care of, of, of these refugees. But the refugee crisis, I mean, the people who have been forced to leave their houses and their loved ones and coming to Armenia is big. And this are going, it is growing every day. This is one thing. So we have to take uh, those who are responsible for, for, for the, this humanitarian crisis to international, to the attention of international organizations, courts, and international community. And then, of course, I think eventually, you cannot be uh, easily uh, playing with the game when you have a platform that allows you to, to solve the problem in a negotiated way, in a normal, inter according to international norms. And that platform is not just new, it is there more than 20 years. And everybody knows that this platform was also the source of peace in the region you cannot come and in one day reject everything and start the war. That means you are taking the full responsibility of starting a war that was not necessary, necessarily necessary at all. This war was not necessary at all because there was a path to peace through negotiations. It was you that decided that you don't go that path, that you were walking for 20 years together with Armenians, together you were walking that path to final resolution of the conflict, you decided to go differently. 
the path of death and war. There is um, a plan in Mr. President for uh, negotiating in Geneva and the uh, Netherlands in uh, next Monday on Moscow between uh, both sides. Um, what do you think about it, Mr. President? Well, I, uh, the only thing that I can think here is any international effort, and this is an effort through affairs that has invited relevant ministers to come to negotiate anything which is taking us back to negotiations, I will support it fully. Anything. If I ask you, Mr. President, for a short message to the, our audience in Arab world, what would you like to say to them? What I would like to say in the Arab world, Arab world, uh, I think it's so difficult to address to Arab world. <laughs> it's huge. It's a, it's a galaxy. It's, a, it's called the Arab world, but there are so many cultures, relations, geographies, and so on and so on. But when I, I hear Arab world, the first words that come to my mind is, is brothers. For a simple reason, even if I go back, I'm not speaking about hundreds of years of relations, trade between Arab world and Armenians. I'm not speaking in the Arab world in, in Egypt. The Armenians were, were, were there in Egypt starting from the times of, of the great library of, of, of Alexandria. No, the, the word is brothers for a simple reason that 105 years ago during the genocide, a big number, hundreds of thousands of Armenians that were running or forced out of their homeland, they went to Arab world and they found their brothers and sisters. They found their brothers and sisters in Syria, in Lebanon, in the Gulf, in Egypt, in Iraq. That's why we had these communities living everywhere in the Arab world. So the first world that comes to me as, a, as to describe Arab world is, is, a, is this is a world of our brothers and sisters. And they have been also suffering themselves at an, under Ottoman Empire. So this is a world that I don't have to describe what happened to Armenians 100 years ago. So my message to my, my friends in Arab world is, I pray God that your countries will stay in peace. I want to make sure that you know that if I can do anything to keep some prosperity and health in your world, in the, in the Arab world of my brothers and sisters, I'll do that. And the third one, dear brothers and sisters, Armenia is facing a grave danger the region is facing a great danger and it's time that you raise your voice and support truth, support uh, people of Armenia and support stability and peace in the region. Thank you, Mr. President, for your time and thank you for your great interview. And till the next time, thank you so much.